Welcome to Off the Record News. I'm your host, Diana Longry. Thank you for tuning in. Off the Record News is brought to you live from the SCC studios out of White Bear Lake. And through a cooperative agreement, this program is also simultaneously broadcast to those studios out of the Roseville viewing area, the CTV studios. And also, we are live in St. Paul through SPNN. And so we are serving approximately 28 communities in the Northeast Metropolitan Area live. And our phone number is on the screen, so I invite you to call in with any questions or comments that you may have on our topics this evening. Now, one of the ways that we find the topics for this program is because of citizens out there in the community who alert us to issues that are going on that are relevant to them. And certainly, one of the hot issues that's been going on over the last week or so is the debate uh, at the legislature having to do with police body cams. Now we've had uh, various individuals on these programs in the past who have talked about the issue of uh, data privacy and access to the data that's collected uh, when there's police body cams. Well, one of our uh, reporters on these programs actually went and addressed one of the local councils and asked them for uh, information on how they are going to look at that. And so we're going to have information on that. Uh, also, some other information came to us from viewers in St. Paul who are concerned about the closure of their community school, Galtier. And so we have film footage on that. Now, these programs, Off the Record News and the other productions that uh, I've been affiliated with, we have had a number of people who have been helping behind the scenes who have found it was a very interesting and exciting hobby that they decided to go out on their own and have their own program. And so it really is a, an been an opportunity for many people in our community to start their own programs. And for those of you who watch public access on a regular basis, certainly you've heard of Speechless, you've heard of Community Talk Live, you've heard of Our World Today, you've heard of many, many different programs that are on the public access channels. Well, for a time, there was, for about a year and a half, two years, there was a program called the Ray Decker Files. And this evening I want to just play what his intro was in tribute and in celebration of his life. Because Ray Decker has passed away and he was a very good dear friend of mine and a good friend of many of the producers out here at SCC. Now, Ray Decker didn't think that he would ever be a public access uh, TV producer and talk show host, but he was, and he uh, took, undertook that endeavor after he was 80 years old. So you see, public access can be for anyone, no matter what your age. If you have something to say, if you have a commitment to uh, having citizen engagement and having people, enabling them to have their voices be heard, then public access is for you, and it is ageless and timeless. So let's play the intro clip from one of Ray Decker's shows so you can see the type of energy that he brought to his productions and, and to his enthusiasm and commitment to public access TV. Let's take a look. Welcome to the big show. He could go all the way. <laughs>
So that, of course, is a tribute to Ray Decker, and we will miss him. Ray Decker had a great sense of humor, and he lived in Maplewood, and when they came to his block to charge a street assessment to him that he felt was not right, was not constitutional, he took on the city, and uh, he and some of his neighbors, they were able to then um, uh, challenge the city, and they were able to get a street assessment that was constitutional and was a more appropriate amount uh, to uh, match what the state law requires. So anyway, Ray Decker, we will miss you. Now, going on to our next topic, uh, we have uh, one of the other programs that has been spawned from all of these productions out here at SCC is the Citizens Reporter that has been on the air since 2009, I believe, or maybe 2008. But we have a number of reporters who are out there gathering information or going to different council meetings of different communities and also the uh, St. Paul School Board. So we've got a clip of one of our reporters that uh, went to the North St. Paul City Council meeting to, uh, first of all, compliment them on a couple of things, but then also ask them uh, some questions that members of the community are thinking about. Let's take a look. Citizen Reporters News, General Business. Mr. Berglund. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Council. Good evening, Mayor. I was very uh, surprised but very honored to uh, walk in here on the Community Awards celebration. And, uh, you know, thank you for having the refreshments out there for people to partake. Right. I know, and I tried some of the cake. And it was excellent. <laughs> Good. I've often tried it in Maplewood, reporting for the Citizen Reporters News, and their cake is generally stale. <laughs> Your cake was excellent. And you had other, other refreshments, too. In Maplewood, they have refreshments every meeting, except that those all the, all their refreshments are in the back room with the city council and the bureaucracy, not allowing even the news media back there, much less the public. Okay. Additionally, you know, I, it's a great honor to see Bob, reporter Bob Zick here. I watch his show every week, Channel 15, at uh, 8:30. Unfortunately, living in Maplewood now, um, wow, Nora Salwick, Mayor of Maplewood, former state representative, has banned. Bob Zick show in Maplewood. His informative analysis is revealing and it's excellent to listen to. I'm very fortunate that often I'm able to acquire from Bob Zick a DVD to keep up on the news because it's one of my best informative sources of what's going on on a local basis. So I want to thank you for having public access here and thank Bob Zick for his great service. He would be an excellent community service award for the future. Additionally, Additionally, the one, uh, the one thing I came here at Citizen Reported in News to alert you that you, you might not be aware, but the, uh, your city council workshop is not on cable TV. We would like, uh, you know, many reporters would like to uh, take a look at that and analyze it. And by having it on cable TV, that would only not even be good for the news media, but would it engage your uh, uh, public. The uh, final thing I would like to uh, add tonight is is that I was watching the state uh, state legislature, which the former council member, Leon Lilly, is on, and he voted along with uh, Maplewood uh, Public Safety Director Paul Schnell, who has been apparently lobbying this full time, and Cornish, I guess he's a Republican for rural Minnesota, for body, to have body cams secret, secret from the news media and the public, which I would stand in uh, objection to. I was, I was uh, coming up here to, first of all, to see if you agree with uh, your former uh, council member and representative of North St. Paul, Leon Lilly, and additionally, what, is, what, what will be your uh, vision and your implementation of the body cams, mm -hmm. and will they be available to the news media once you've implemented, and what kind of cost would that incur? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. I appreciate your thoughts. Yes, thank you. So that, of course, is uh, one of the reporters from the Citizens Reporter uh, asking the North St. Paul City Council, one, to uh, televise their workshops. Now, Maplewood has been televising their workshops since approximately 2004, 
I believe it is, 2004 or 5. And that was, at that time, actually an initiative that a number of other citizens in Maplewood, along with myself, that we went up before the council on numerous occasions and really talked about the importance and relevancy of cable casting the workshops of the city council and the cable casting of all the commission meetings so that the residents of the community are fully aware and have that opportunity of knowing what is happening at their local level. Because after all, that is where we all have the most impact in how our, our communities are governed. And last week and the week before that, we have on these programs talked about the fact that we have sent out reporters to the St. Paul School Board meetings that they have. It's the meeting of the whole, which is not the school board, the formal school board meeting that generally that you see that there's the public and the public comment, but the, the, the meeting of the whole is in a room where it's not equipped for uh, being cable cast conveniently. And we have had uh, on numerous occasions volunteer uh, reporters there with a camera so that we can bring that film footage to the viewers so you can see what the discussions are because oftentimes these discussions lay the foundation for the ultimate decisions that are made at the council or the board meetings. So oftentimes if you only watch that council or that board meeting and it appears like they really aren't discussing things very much or that there's not as much uh, interaction as you would expect them to have, it's because they have had these other meetings which uh, are public and the public could attend, but either because they're held at a time when the public was is working because it's during the daytime, uh, or that the meetings aren't cable cast and people aren't aware of their occurrence, well, then you don't know what's happening. Now, we uh, are now uh, going to uh, play some film footage from a recent uh, meeting of the whole of the St. Paul School Board. And this is where, and we've covered this somewhat, but I want to tie it in with now what happened last night and some of the discussions that happened last night at their school board meeting is that at the meeting of the whole they they were talking about putting together their student policy their policy rather for student discipline and the question was okay how do we dance around the word discipline I mean, can we use the word discipline? Maybe that's bias. Maybe that is showing we have a bias. Uh, and, and so really there was this feeling that by using the word discipline that somehow or other uh, they are, um, uh, you know, discriminating uh, or showing a bias towards certain factions of the student body. Well, let's take a look at our first clip and recap some of those comments. As a reminder, the preliminary uh, oh, general fund uh, okay. shortfall well, is 15. Okay, just let's pull that back. Okay, so let's go to the clip that, keep that clip up that you have because that's for the next segment, but go to the one that says discipline four. And then we'll play Discipline 4 and then Discipline 5 after that, and then we'll go to the budget. Thank you. So I have, I have a question. Should this policy be called student discipline? Or should it be um, classroom climate or something else and have discipline as a piece of it? Is that it could be something like established lane, positive school climates. It could still be expectations. Or, you know. I don't know. I, I just, 
calling it student discipline says, okay, we're promoting it's, positive learning environment. Because what we're talking about is what is what do we what want? Just, like, a, a this is about, right if we're not there, then how do we get back? Yeah. Um, I think. So. I, I, I don't know. I, so you see, it, it, it's like, well, we're, we're, we're tiptoeing around here. We've, we've got eggshells we're walking on. And, and you heard the words expectations. Well, expectations are important to reinforce in the classroom because you cannot have chaos if you want the children to learn. So let's listen to our next clip, Discipline 5, and hear what another uh, comment is. If I'm not mistaken, when we last did the rewrite on our Rights and Responsibilities book, we took a stab at least at the beginning part of it to talk about what the expectations were. We tried to make that a bigger part of the focus. It has shared responsibilities. Like I said, um, John astutely pointed out that it's not, it doesn't have the shared philosophy as explicit, but it does have shared responsibilities for students, staff, and I wonder if expectations instead of responsibility. Expectations. But we're going to break in here a little bit because you see, I, I see a distinction because you can have, you have to have both sides of the coin. You have to have what the expectations are. This concept of shared responsibilities, well, that, sure, that's, in theory, that's a good concept. Everybody has shared responsibilities in good behavior. But there has to be some kind of consequences if you do not live up to those shared responsibilities. So that is the hard piece. And, and that is where the quote unquote discipline comes in. So you can't just say, we're only going to address the one side of the coin and we're only going to be talking about expectations and about shared responsibilities and the utopia of how we're going to have good behavior and how everyone is expected to have certain norms of good behavior. You have to also have, well, what happens if somebody doesn't live up to their shared responsibility? So let's continue on with the, the clip. <laughs> and I certainly understand Zuki's uh, uneasiness and discomfort because that word dis discipline has become a, a real... It's become descriptive to a group of students. Mm -hmm. well, Very descriptive to a group of students. Yeah, and I, 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 I don't know if, if that may very well be true. I, I, I... So I'm not clear what it means that discipline Dis, the word discipline is descriptive to a certain group of kids. I don't understand what that means. And I wish that they would have gone into that in more depth to understand because perhaps the school board members are trying to feel each other out to see how much they can talk frankly with each other about this subject. But to me, discipline is identifying that if you haven't uh, lived up to whatever the expectations are, the shared responsibilities, all these uh, attributes that were discussed previously in our other two clips, that what are the consequences? That's really what I see that they need to bridge the gap and now talk about is what is that next step? How do you get children who aren't living up to the expectations set, how do you inspire them to say, well, I see a value in it for me to do that? I mean, there's different ways that parents out there, and you know what I mean, different ways that you do that. Um, but that's really the discussion that they have to have. They have to talk about what their public policy is for consequences in the event that the children don't live up to the expectations or the shared responsibilities that the school has set forth. And that 
is a conversation they're not having. Let's continue with our clip. Somehow I've turned it around to be, because somehow in my mind, what our schools should be, or should have, are high standards. Because now that sounds, high. everybody likes to hear about high standards. And we always talk about high academic standards. But we also have to have high standards so that our schools are safe, secure, polite, and respectful. If all of our kids could be encouraged to act like that, then we wouldn't have to apply any external discipline. I, I just think we, I think we're missing the boat when we when we because so many the right wing somehow has captured this uh, yeah. talk about teaching values, and so every time you hear about people talking teaching values, you say, "Oh, that's right wingers trying to put something into the public education that doesn't belong." Well, the fact of the matter is. Safe, secure, polite, respectful, those are all values, I think, that we should be encouraging. But values to whom? To all of us. Are you sure? Safe, secure, polite, respectful. I think the word it is, but how does it look like? It may be different. And that, of course, is the superintendent challenging uh, uh, school board member Broderick about whether or not these are shared values. And I think that it's the school board that has to set the public policy that if it is indeed the school district's public policy to have safety, security, and respect, then they set that policy and then they have to set how do they achieve it. It's not whether or not if all the body, if, if that's the value of all the body, because they're not there to do a survey of the body to figure out what are those values and then we're going to implement those values. That may work in some models in a different setting. But if you're talking about a public school system, it isn't about what the values are of all these different kids and letting the kids set the values and then the school district and the school board is going to figure out how to implement the values of all the people that are there in the schools. It really should be more the other way around that the adults are leading the children to learn what values, if that's the word you want to use, or how that safety is important in the school setting. Children should not be in fear that they're going to get beat up on the playground. It is imperative that our schools are safe. So it's up to the school board to figure out what the policies are and then how to implement those policies. So I, I think they got a lot of work to do on this and I think they're too worried about being politically correct and making sure that they're not stepping on somebody's toes that they have to just have some frank conversations and you know I know that it was kind of surprising though one of the school board members at that meeting said you know I, I don't know what I can say anymore I, I don't know if I say this I'm going to get beat down by one group of people if I say this I'm going to get beat down by another group of people well in the end um, you know that's 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 really tough if it's gotten to that point that you don't know what you can say anymore because uh, you, everybody wants you to pander to their needs. The school board has to look after the best interests of the school and the children. So now the next thing that they're working on that's a big issue at the school district and this just is from last night's meeting is the budget. Well their budget they've got some problems and so let's take a look at our first slide to talk about that talks a little bit about the budget I mean the thing about the presentation on the budget went over an hour so we're just going to show you a couple quick clips here so that that way you get a, a brief overview of what the big problem is let's take a look as a reminder the preliminary uh, general fund uh, shortfall is 15.1 million 
And there's a couple pieces that go with that. We look at revenue, and then we also look at projected expense, including an amount for inflation. So again, we are looking at a $15.1 million shortfall. Um, how does that um, shortfall, um, what feeds into that? Uh, first and foremost, there was a projection that was provided to you in early January of about $9.3 million that um, we were projecting at the time to be the shortfall for next year. Um, on top of that, there was uh, negotiated contractual settlements that exceeded our projection. That was about $3.5 million. And then the compensatory uh, education revenue numbers um, came in a little worse than we had projected. Those numbers came in after um, January, and that was another $1.1 million in addition to a um, updated enrollment projection of another $1.2 million. $15 million shortfall, that is pretty substantial. Now, this was discussed at the meeting of the whole a week ago, at the meeting that we had our cameras at, and Ironically, it was council uh, or school board member Broderick who brought up the uh, issue of austerity measures and that maybe they might have to freeze salaries. Now, the people in the room did not appear to be very happy uh, about that possibility because as you can see, they have a lot of contractual obligations with uh, various people that are under union contract. And to have to start to propose that we're going to have salary freezes, well, that really does open up a big kettle of worms. Uh, but it was uh, certainly suggested and that austerity, other austerity measures might need to be taken, at least in the short term, until uh, the school district can get out of the hole. Let's take a look at our next clip and, and get a little additional insight on this. Several of us have, have talked about is the sustainability of anything we do. And so I, while I appreciate that... Um, and I'm my background is in arts and and uh, um, certainly we have to have a commitment to that in our district uh, the, the educating the whole child and then and, and that's some of these things that uh, that are we have to figure out how we're going to fund them moving forward and what that looks like in our schools and we have to be creative about it and we have to talk to uh, or engage our communities in that conversation but I don't know if if um, saying that we have to, that that is what we want to charge um, our staff with is trying to figure out the answer to 4.5 million and well, it, you know when I'm listening to that it sounds like well certainly uh, there might have to be cuts in various programs maybe in the arts programs uh, and yet how does that equate then with the concept that you want to uh, have a holistic approach to education for the children. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing. Now, there are several of the board members that are relatively new on the board. They've just been elected. They were elected because they were going to make some changes and that they were going to make things right because there were a lot of things that, that the, the parents and the teachers were unhappy about. And so there was supposed to be the new revolution with the election of uh, uh, many new uh, school board members. So let's listen to our next clip. Go Things ahead. are stuck together. I realize that I think that for the long term, they are, is that the concept of being able to support that um, uh, is, you know, we may have to think about a different way. That that's a longer, a longer term solution. You know, um, that I think we can't solve in these next two weeks. But if we can come up with a, a number, like you said, Director Vu, if there's a number, whether it's based on that or not, of what would help the the schools um, support programming that they feel is critical. Is that 
a week ago at the meeting of the whole, they were talking about this and talking about their deadline in which they have to get this settled and resolved. And again, now we hear, okay, now they've got two weeks to figure out how they're going to deal with this $15 million shortfall. Well, my question is, is that all along the way, how come the superintendent hasn't been giving some monthly thought to how this shortfall is going to be taken care of? Because when they first started out the their fiscal year, uh, they had to know where they were starting from. And if you start watching your books as you progress, somewhere along the way, you realize you're starting to go in the wrong direction somehow, and you should be making adjustments. Now, maybe they did that, and we just aren't aware of that, but it certainly sounds from listening to the uh, the comments at the meeting of the board of the whole and listening to the comments made at the school board meeting it seems like this sort of crept up on them yes they had this projected shortfall um, of nine million as you heard in that slide that they were told uh, a while back it was going to be nine million dollars shortfall well that's still a huge shortfall and now that's ballooned to 15 million. Well, they've gone in the wrong direction over the length of time from when there was gonna be a $9 million shortfall to what it is today at 15 million. So let's continue with our clip. Uh, if, there's, if there's a way to come up with a number like that and say, see if you can find this much and we'll figure out an equitable way to distribute it. No, no. I, I, what I want to understand is that if you look at what's on the screen right now, mm -hmm. it seems like the board is concentrated on this four and a half million dollar, right? Yes, direct impact on students. Okay, so so it's a four and a half million dollars, not the other areas. Uh, that's what Director Ellis. That's what Director Ellis has said. That is what I said. She's the one that identified the four point five million dollars and wondered where we would pay for that. I don't know if that's a general board uh, opinion or not, that that's where we want to focus on. But So just I guess then I'm confused. You know, I, I want to know, I guess one of the confusion I have is with this suggested, uh, recommended, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cuts here, uh, you know, if we're fine with well, I guess, what are we not fine with then? Uh, so, so that we can identify. Is the classic comment that really sums up this budgeting process that we see unfolding before us is that you've got the, uh, the uh, superintendent who should have been working on this diligently for months and months and months top on the priority list together with all the other top administrators that are under her who are working on this budget and yet it appears like the school board members are really only sort of getting informed and and made privy to what is being recommended or what is possible two weeks before the deadline this is no way to operate one of the largest, if not the largest, school district in the state of Minnesota. And we're wondering, you know, <laughs> whether or not if they're going to call their, their discipline book a student discipline policy or a classroom climate uh, initiative. You see, <laughs> it just somehow seems like there's a disconnect there. And it wasn't until I started watching this that I realized that there does seem to be this type of uh, not enough information going to the school board members so that they can actively participate as the representatives uh, that they were elected to be. Because how can they do their job if they haven't been given sufficient information upon which to even make decisions or even to ask questions? So let's continue with our clip. Go ahead. 
I, I know the hour is late and we still have more to talk about. Um, and, and I'm trying to do this and, and keep focused here. So I, I, I think the meeting that you just suggested, Chair, is one that might may be helpful to sit down with, with, with Chief Walker and the superintendent and some of the senior staff. I'm happy to be there. If there are other board members, obviously, we have to just be sensitive to the numbers. I would prefer if it's not just me. Um, that it would maybe be one or two other board members. Uh, because now, he just said something that really seriously bothers me. He's suggesting that they sit down, some of the board members, and they sit down with the superintendent or the people in charge of the numbers and find out more about what is going on. Okay, why this bothers me? is that he said, one, we have to be sensitive of the numbers because he wants to make sure that they don't have a quorum and that they don't have an open meeting. Because if they have an open meeting, then that means that the public is entitled to be there and they don't want the numbers to be out in the public, even though all of the data having to do with their budgets and their numbers is all private data anyway. So if we had that knowledge and knew how to craft our data practice request, we could get that data, that information, whether they have their public information meeting with their top advisors or not. You see what I mean? But he looks like he's trying to sidestep the open meeting law so that that way this data won't become public. The other thing that I find that troubles me about this is that if this, this, the, the people who are in charge of the numbers, the higher, high level staff people are meeting with part of the board but not with the other part of the board, then that means that some of the members have the information and other members do not. And now you don't have a fully informed board that can work together to solve the issues together through open and honest and frank discussions with everybody having the same information and the same depth of knowledge of that information. So this idea that, well, let's just have a meeting of one or two of us or three of us, while it sounds kind of good, if you think about it under the surface, it's not as good as it sounds. Let's continue on. The others on the board to express their own thoughts about this. Perhaps to talk again through what, what has been proposed. Work backwards with the assistant superintendents on if we were to restore X amount, what would that mean programmatically? How would that make a difference? Where would that come from? All these things he's talking about, these should all be discussed in a workshop setting, in a board setting, in the public, so the public can hear these discussions to talk about the justifications of doing this versus that, of understanding of what is the thought process of taking this avenue versus another avenue. The public has the right to know that. And yet the way he is proposing that they set their structure up in some little subcommittee type of format, it's a way to keep the public shut out from the process of understanding how they are working their solutions to this $15 million shortfall problem. And if the public doesn't know, uh, how they are working to find their solutions, then certainly all this talk about getting public input is really a facade and it's not reality at all. Because if your public doesn't have any information from which that they can participate, you're not going to be getting public participation in your outreach to help figure out how to solve the problem at hand. Um, it's... it's uh, a very uh, convenient way to give lip service to say we're going to have public input. But if you don't have the foundation and the, um, the way in which to 
inform the public so that they can meaningfully participate. All the talk about public engagement is a facade. So let's move on to our next clip, which I believe has to do with the uh, public, public comment period of the um, school board meeting. And I want to kind of dissect this a little bit and also highlight a few of the comments that were made by the public. So are we at public comment number one? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, we're going to uh, start with our public comment period here. So. Uh, first of all, I have to read this. Uh, this provides the public comment uh, provides opportunity for the public to bring issues or comments to the attention of the Board of Education. All speakers are asked to sign in uh, on the sign in log and complete a sign in form if they wish. Forms are at the table near the entrance door. Uh, the public comment ends at 5 30. Uh, the sign in ends at 5 30. Uh, you remind you can sign in ahead of time by calling the board secretary or online. So I, I found it kind of humorous that at the beginning he says I have to read this well I know what he meant but it, I just thought it was kind of a, a, a funny little way of putting it I have to read this now with their public comment uh, typically they say you get three minutes but if they see that there are a certain number of people well then they adjust the amount of time that uh, each person gets to speak because they are only going to stick to a certain block of time for public comment. So if you have only one person who is going to speak uh, during that 30 minute period of time, for instance, that person gets three minutes. They don't get 30 minutes to talk. If you have two people, well, they each get three minutes and then the other rest of the time, well, you know, they recess and, and that's that. But if you have, uh, 15 or 20 people who want to speak, then they cut down the number of seconds that you get to speak. And in this case, at this meeting, they told everybody, you only get two minutes to speak. Now, it's important that no matter what uh, entity that you want to speak in front of, that you understand what their policies are. Because if you are going there thinking that you have three minutes to speak, but then you get there and find out they have now cut it down to two minutes, you better make sure that the most important things you have to say are in the first two minutes of their, your speech and not the last minute of your speech. So my advice to anybody out there is make sure you put your most important statements at the beginning of your speech. Don't spend a lot of time with platitudes about thank you for the opportunity of speaking with you and oh, you know, I, you know, you all have a lovely hairdos today and that kind of thing. You have to really get to the meat and potatoes of it because they're only going to give you a very short period of time for you to belt out your comments in a meaningful way that they'll remember when they get to that item on the agenda item. Because at the school board meeting, for instance, here, when they start talking about the budget, they don't open it up for public comment to see what the people of the community have to say about those slides that we were looking at or the comments of the, uh, the board members. Uh, they had to rely upon their memory about what was being said by the public at the uh, public comment time at the beginning of the meeting. Same way holds true with the discussion about closing the Gull Tier School. People who wanted to talk about that had to speak about it real quick. They had two minutes to do so. They had to do it at the beginning of the meeting, and it wasn't until near the end of the meeting or middle part of it that then the school board finally got around to talking about that issue. So we'll more on that. So let's go on to our second clip, public comment number two. This public comment is an opportunity for us, the board, to listen. So as a general rule, the board will not comment on or respond to any comments made by speakers. Audience members are asked to remain quiet during public comments so all in attendance may hear. Speakers are advised that any complaint or issue related to personnel must be made in writing. For your own legal protection and the legal right. Okay, so of course now they're protecting uh, people legally that they can't talk about an employee because 
well, you know, we don't want you talking about an employee because that'll protect you, you legally. Well, uh, you know, I think that that isn't necessarily uh, quite accurate, but be it as it may, that is uh, what their policy is at this particular uh, board. Now let's move on to our next clip. The order in which speakers will be called is as follows. Students, speakers speaking to an agenda related item, then others in the order of names received with preference given to those who have not spoken in the past three months. The time allowed. So the first uh, priority person to be able to speak is a student. Okay, and in the past I have always observed that the students and the definition of students refers to somebody who is going to the St. Paul schools, one of the St. Paul schools, okay, one of the high schools, the middle school, elementary school, but is enrolled somewhere between K through 12, okay? That's the definition from what I can tell watching these uh, meetings that that's what a student is. Okay, now did he say anything about in their rules, what do they do when somebody gets up to speak and they're not in the category that they're supposed to be in? I don't know. Well, let's see. Let's see, does that ever happen? Well, let's take a look at our next clip. First category. We're going to follow those rules about asking our students to speak first. Um, and so our first three speakers will be Daniel Bauman, or Bowman, uh, Maurice Fields, and James Farnsworth. And so as she said, we're going to follow those rules. We're going to have our students speak first. So let's continue with this clip. Go All ahead. Four as we go here. If you just give us your name as your speaker. Uh, hello, my name is Maurice Fields. Um, yeah. So, can I start? Can I start? Cool. Uh, <laughs> my name is Maurice Fields. I'm actually a central graduate. And so, he's not actually a student at all. He's a graduate. Well, now he's in a different category. He's either there for an agenda item or on an item that's not on the agenda. He's no longer a student. He's graduated. But they continue to let him speak anyway rather than say, well, sir, you have to get and wait to the end of the line until the students are done speaking. They didn't do that. And so when they're talking about, as we were saying at the beginning of the program, talking about expectations and standards and setting rules, well, here they are. They have a rule. They've set a standard. They want people to adhere to these standards. You heard what they said, and yet, then they don't enforce them. What, does, what kind of example does that set? We make a rule, but then you don't have to follow it. Let's go on to our next clip. District, my name is Bob Spaulding. I'm an SPPS parent. And like many of you in this room, I share a deep concern about the budget um, and the loss of specialist positions and electives across the district. There are so many reasons for the budget shortfall, and I agree that we should be looking at ways to cut things like administration if we can. I suspect there are practical and mathematical limits. So here we have a concerned parent. He is talking about the $15 million shortfall, and maybe he's got some good ideas on areas that they can look into to either try to boost revenue or cut costs or whatever. But in two minutes, how will he ever be able to share that with the school board, with the public? You can't do much in two minutes when it comes to in-depth issues such as talking about a budget shortfall of $15 million. And the other thing that struck me too is that in this type of a situation, I would recommend that if you know that you cannot speak on the agenda item when it's time that that agenda item comes before the governing body, that when you stand up and you introduce yourself, 
tell the board, tell the elected officials, I am here to speak on agenda item number K5, and then tell them what that is. So that way they can make a note of that mentally or on their agenda that you are making your comments relative to that item because it will help to uh, certainly to center what your comments are focused on so that they don't have to just think well I guess it must be about the budget he's talking about I don't know for sure because you may have on your agenda a, a broad category and then you may have subcategories under that broad category and if that's the case you want to clue them in right to where to go on the agenda for when they're thinking about your comments and what they pertain to because you only have two minutes to get their attention so let's go on to our next clip Go My ahead. name is Mara Martinson, and I'm a parent of two Galtier Community School students. And tonight I could really easily use this time to discuss what Galtier really means to me and my family, but instead I want to bring up three crucial facts for the board to take into consideration. The first is that Galtier is the name of our school, but the data and the reputation of the past struggles of Galtier do not represent our current school. Galtier went through a dramatic transition two years ago when teachers adopted the personalized learning model and the building was remodeled to support that particular individualized instruction and co-teaching best practices. So this particular school... Uh, and just beginning to overcome okay. the misconceptions in our community. Okay, so this particular school, as you heard, was just given a new direction two years ago and then remodeled in consistency with that new direction and that new teaching model. But now, two years later, before they've even had a chance to really make a go of it, to really, you know, get, uh, you know, it established, they're talking, the school district is talking about closing them down. Well, what happened to all the money that was just invested two years ago to get this new initiative started, to get the remodeling done, and now they're going to shut it down? You see, that it, to me sounds like the people that somewhere along the way, somebody was thinking that it was, sounded like a good project, but they either didn't plan for the long-term sustainable uh, financial uh, support of this model, or they, they only did it short term because it sounded good at the time. And, and you really can't make these kind of decisions with that uh, type of a frame of mind. It has to be much more long term and financially sustainable. As you heard one of the uh, board members mention in a previous clip tonight. So let's continue with this uh, uh, parent's comments because they, they really are uh, very thoughtful new reputation due to the district's very public conversations regarding the future closure. The second point is Galtier has a unique program. If the district loses Galtier through closure or by failure to provide a statement of support, you can undo current or you can to undo current perceptions of imminent closure, we will lose our strong school in our strong community, but even more so the district is going to lose. They will lose the opportunity to reach out to families leaving the district for other options. We have submitted to the board an outline of our individualized education with differentiated practices at Galtier and how the building is specifically designed to support that personalized approach to education and it's working. We are small, yes, but within those two short years we're already seeing the positive effects. In fact, 18% of our current kindergarten students have tested into the gifted and talented uh, program. Galtier is the destination for students who want to receive individualized support that they need for their future success without isolation or exclusionary practices. Third thing we want to bring up is we need answers. The families, teachers, and staff cannot be left in limbo any longer. The publications regarding the closing of Galtier have devastated our children and our families. We want to stop the fight to save Galtier and work to grow Galtier with the district. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Now, we had talked earlier in the program about uh, the districts, the St. Paul School Districts, uh, you know, 
concern about uh, whether or not there is racial bias within the schools and about um, bigotry and, and about whether or not their policies and practices are, are not neutral or not. Well, I started thinking about when you're looking at closing a school such as Galtier, it almost sounds like there's maybe an institutional bias that maybe the school board hasn't identified that is occurring because it appears that this is indeed uh, a community school that serves a need for that particular community and the school district only just started uh, with the program two years ago, invested a lot of money into it, and now they're going to cut the you know, cut the, the school out. So I think there needs to be a little bit more thought put into whether or not if they're just going to close the school or not. Now we have time for the next parent whose comments uh, there were. So let's take a look at the next uh, comments. Go ahead. Charlotte Flowers and Wendy Miller. Hi, I'm Charlotte Flowers and I have two students in the district, um, including a son at Hamlin Elementary. And I've been part of the parent group Hamlin Midway Community Schools um, that worked in a 10 month process um, with our friends at Galtier and Hamlin Elementary. Um, our main goal um, was to have two community schools in Midway that are surviving and thriving. And I know that after um, a long process of our recru us recruiting for our school and Galtier recruiting for their school, that has been um, a real struggle and I think we've kind of come to an impasse and we support both of our schools staying open. One of the things though that we need to look at strategically is an area E when you do the path of least resistance. Um, Galtier, Hamlin and Como Elementary have 88, 85 and 86 reduced and free lunch percentage of students. 89, 88 and 90% students of color. Chelsea Heights has 46% reduced in free lunch and 52% students of color. St. Anthony Park has 25% reduced in free lunch and 34% students of color. So I think that this is a challenge to look at if we want to do something about keeping schools balanced and open and integrated in our district, we can't just look at what parents are choosing on their own because what they choose is segregation. Um, so if we want to keep Galtier open and we want to keep Hamlin open and we want all our schools to thrive in Area E, we need to address this bigger issue and it's bigger than either of the parent groups or anybody coming together. It's going to take a long community process. Thank you. And the point she's making is that the school board has to recognize that perhaps they are perpetuating institutional bias by the thought that they are going to close these two schools. Uh, and that was, I think, very eye-opening to me to hear this parent show those statistics to the school board and talk to them about uh, the, the facts of comparing those two schools to some of the other schools in the St. Paul School District system. There's so much more that could be said about what went on at that school board meeting but we've won, run out of time. And I hope you have at least found this somewhat insightful and interesting because even though you, if you don't live in the St. Paul School District, these principles could apply to your district too. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.